When I say the word deacon, what comes to your mind? Are they the people who hand you your bulletin on Sunday or take up the offering? At some churches, that may be the case. But at this church, a deacon is so much more. Deacons are the ones who spend time with us at hospitals, whether it's life or death. They're the ones on Sunday serving us the Lord's Supper. The body of Christ, broken for you, take and eat all of it. Assisting our baptisms. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And serving widows. The deacons are the hands and feet of the church. But not anyone can be a deacon. As the church, we hold this position in high regard. In 1 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul lays out the requirements for a deacon. He says that a deacon is to be a man worthy of respect, hold the deep truths of the faith, be faithful to his wife, and have great assurance in his faith in Christ Jesus. So how do we find men like this? They're nominated to serve by people like you. Over the next two weeks, you'll have the opportunity to nominate men who become the deacons of church. This is your opportunity to help us find the hands and feet of the church. If you've been in our church any period of time at all, you've likely been the recipient of the ministry of one of our deacons. And this is indeed a very important ministry in our church because they are the hands and feet of Jesus. If uh, we, we take time out every year for about three weeks to receive nominations for deacons. And so if you would take that nomination form that's in your bulletin and uh, look over that. And if you have some thoughts about who you might nominate in a church our size, you are the best source of names of people that we may not be aware of who could uh, serve as a deacon. So we'd encourage you to be prayerfully considering that. Take it home if you would like and bring it back next week if you'd like to consider that and pray over it for a little bit longer period of time. But please do participate in that process. We would greatly appreciate it. My name is Steve Smith. I'm one of the ministers here. I'd like to especially welcome any first-time guests that we have in that same bulletin. There's a tear-off, a communication card. We would encourage you to complete that and uh, let us know that you're here so that we can be in touch with you in the days to come. Uh, and if you're a member or a regular attender, as always, you can use that card for a prayer request or to uh, update your contact information. We'd be happy to receive that as well. Well, if you've noticed over the last few weeks, you may have noticed that we're having a celebration this year, 50 years of Brentwood Baptist Church. And we've had a few celebrations already, some smaller things, but our signature event for this celebration is next Sunday, May the 5th, from 3 to 6 p.m. here on the Brentwood campus in the rear parking lot. We're going to have a festival. And uh, we felt like that we've done, the, we've done these a couple times in the past, and in a church our size, we don't often get opportunities just to come together for fun and fellowship and connect with people that you haven't seen in a while. So we'd encourage you to make a note of this and be here. There will be uh, games for all ages. There will be food. There will be some entertainment from our all of our campuses. The worship ministries are, of our campuses are going to come together, and there will be a stage there with some presentations. And so this will be a wonderful time to get together and to celebrate all that God has done in these 50 years of uh, Brentwood Baptist Church. Oh, and as of this past week, all the cotton candy you want to eat. We will have cotton candy. So please be here for that next Sunday afternoon. We appreciate it. We're privileged to have Chris Brooks deliver our sermon today. And so I would ask that you be in prayerful uh, consideration of his words that he's going to be bringing in a little while and also for our worship teams. Let's open our service now with prayer, shall we? Father, we come before you now with open hearts and open minds, and we pray that you would speak to us through your spirit. And may everything that we experience and that we learn from you and that we experience from you be done in spirit and in truth. We thank you for this opportunity to gather each and every week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. children of free. 
lift up our praise together. Who am I? I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. That's who we are today.
listen to this verse from Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, into our lives. Lord, give us power, your anointing. We sing to you.
our living hope. And last Sunday, we gathered here and we celebrated He is alive. Maybe you're like me some Sundays. You need to come back and take a glimpse again to be told He is alive. He is our living hope. The Word says that if we have hoped in Jesus Christ in this life alone, we are of all men to be pitied. But make no mistake, He is indeed alive. And the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And so we boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence. I want to invite you to join your prayers with mine during this time. We're just going to be still before the Lord. Pastor Chris is going to be here kneeling at the altar if you'd like to come and pray with him. It's not so much about your physical posture as it is the posture of our hearts. And so I invite you to lean in with me as we take our hearts and lay them before the Lord. Will you pray with me? Spirit, we know that you are here. We feel your presence. God, I thank you so much that we serve and believe in and worship a living hope. God, I pray that as we go into this worship time, as Chris is your messenger, God, and you bring us a word, that we would all lean our hearts in, Lord, and listen. We thank you, God, that you don't leave us at the door, but in our lives, you can be glorified every moment of every day. Thank you for all the bountiful gifts you've given us, but most of all, the sweet presence of your spirit. And we ask it all in your holy, matchless name. Amen.
as we continue worshiping this morning and come to our time of giving, I'd like to tell you a story. It's a story of God's perfect provision and the faithfulness of one of our members. So many years ago, as this church building was being built, there were many planning meetings. And in one of those meetings one morning, they were talking about the cost of building the steeple. Well, one of those team members realized that he had a check in his pocket for the exact amount it would cost to build the steeple. The problem was that check was designated funds that was meant to be mailed later that afternoon to the IRS for his tax payment. So, feeling overwhelmed by the Spirit, he decided to give that money to the church. Well, you can imagine the rest of the day was spent feeling a bit apprehensive about how he was gonna pay his taxes. And moreover, what was he gonna tell his wife about what he'd done? So, later that afternoon, there was a knock at his door in his office. And it was his assistant saying, there is a man here who really needs to talk to you, but he doesn't have an appointment. And he said, well, of course, show him in. So as that man came in his office, he said, I'm gonna need your help. You're an attorney. I'm going to need good legal counsel for a new business venture. I'd like to write you a check today if you would agree to take on my case. And I guess I probably don't have to tell you that the amount of that check was exactly what was needed to pay his tax payment. Now, <laughs> praise God. Now, I love that story for so many reasons. But especially being a person who gets to work with first-time guests often, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, I would drive past this church day after day and I would see the steeple from I-65 and I just couldn't ignore the pull I felt to pull in and visit this place. So I hope that story reminds you that God delights in our generosity and he can be trusted with our every need. So as our ushers come forward this morning to receive our tithes and our offerings, would you please pray with me? Father, what an honor and privilege it is to get to partner with you in the work you are doing in our community. Would you take these gifts given this morning, God, and would you multiply them and use them for your glory and your great name's sake. We pray these things in the majestic name of Jesus. Amen. God's story, it's a story of a word, a message, good news. That word is Jesus. He's the message that's been declared to humanity even before our beginning. I guess you could say God's always been trying to have a gospel conversation with us. We want to suggest to you four gospel conversations you should always be having anywhere, anytime, with anybody. They're summed up by four widths with God. Don't just listen to him. Listen for him. Don't just tell him what you think he wants to hear. Let him hear what you're actually thinking. He wants to keep reminding you of the message he's been trying to communicate to us all along. With other believers. Yep, have gospel conversation with other believers. Don't think of the gospel as that elementary teaching you've matured beyond. The gospel of Jesus is an ocean of grace and truth you won't ever find the depth of. So keep talking about it with believers, reminding each other how it comes to bear in our own lives and in all of our relationships. With those yet to believe. This one's a little more obvious, right? Uh, let me be clear about two things though. One, I don't know is okay for you to say. You don't have to know everything. Most people will welcome learning something with you more than learning something from you. And two, listening well is more important than answering correctly. 
Don't give answers to questions they're not asking. Listen for questions that people are actually asking. And let them know how the gospel has helped you with your own questions. And finally, with myself. How can I have a gospel conversation with myself? Well, you already have lots of other conversations with yourself, right? I mean, thoughts and voices on repeat in your head, what you think of God, what you think of yourself. Not only are they usually not beneficial, they usually aren't true. Isn't it more important what God thinks of you than what you think of God? Isn't what God thinks of me more definitive than what I think of myself? The four widths of engaging in gospel conversations. May we remember that God's story, His message, the gospel of Jesus, is the context of our own story. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. May it be so among us. Well, good morning, church. I'm going to say, bless the Lord, if you'll say, oh, my soul. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. I'm Chris. I'm one of the pastors on staff. For those of you who chose to stay after it was announced I was preaching, thank you. <laughs> For those of you who are new, Mike will be back next week. Um, he is still in bed after preaching 8,000 services on Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> Just kidding. He's on the couch by now. Uh, I am grateful to be a part of a church that celebrates and welcomes a diversity in voices and style and dress and pastoring and preaching. And so um, I'm what you've got this morning. Pray for me. I pray that the Holy Spirit will come upon us in power. I have prayed for you. I've prayed over every single pew in this room. It took a while, um, but you have been prayed for. Um, you guys are Romans 8. You were Psalm 23 up there. You guys down here were some Paul's prayers. You guys, I ran out of scripture at that point and needed to learn, I needed to memorize some more. But um, I, uh, I've been praying that the Lord would show up with power through his Holy Spirit for us this morning. I, I, I don't know about you, but I need more than an hour on Sunday morning to live the life that Jesus is calling me to live. Um, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, it took effort to get here this morning, didn't it? Is it? Any of you other dirty sinners like me, when the alarm goes off, think, ah, I'd like to sleep in today. <laughs> Am I the only sinner in this room? I, I actually had additional responsibilities this morning, so I don't know if that thought crossed my mind. I thought, hey, next Sunday I want to sleep in. <laughs> but thanks for being here. I, I know that's not without effort. I have seven humans living under my roof, and it is a Herculean effort every Sunday to get us up and motivated into church, and we're barely Christian by the time we get here. <laughs> Anybody else tired this week after Easter? Anybody else just a little bit too busy? Anybody else a little bit overwhelmed by all the things that you're not doing and should be doing? Me too. I want to say thank you for being here this morning. And I am praying that the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power to empower you, to bear witness to the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, to his joy, to his patience, to his kindness, and to his love, and to his mercy. One of the ways that we want to do that is we realize it, it doesn't just happen an hour on Sunday. We want to constantly be resourcing and equipping you and reminding you about how it is that you can be image bearers and light sharers of the mission and message of Jesus. We're going to put a number on the screen, and if you want to, you can text gospel to that number. And so we're going to continue throughout the week to give devotionals, resources, and links any way that we can continue to equip ourselves to be the kind of people who are ready and willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody. And since I have a couple minutes with you guys, um, I just want to say hi from Kairos. That's the Tuesday night congregation that I get to pastor. Um, we're getting ready for our summer swell, which means we'll have seven or 800 people on Tuesday nights down in Hudson Hall. We target young adults, but nobody listens to us, which is fine by me. Um, and it's going to be incredible. And I just want to let you know that it's become a haven for people who are wounded, jaded, or skeptical of institutional church. 
but it's also been an incredible resurgence of healthy disciples who are making disciples. And on a Tuesday night, they just want to make more space for the power of the Holy Spirit in their everyday life to live the dangerous call of discipleship out in ordinary and extraordinary ways. I also want you to know that we believe we are a critical and crucial part to this church family. We take our role and responsibility very seriously. Two years ago, when Mike helped unveil that jaw-dropping vision statement, right? We're going to have 500,000 gospel conversations, 10,000 disciples making disciples. I want to let you know, to date, we've had 950 gospel conversations. Four people have come to Christ, and we baptized four people at Kairos uh, two Tuesdays ago at Kairos. So it's going incredible. Four people we baptized, Will and Jessica, young married couple expecting uh, their first child. We baptized her while she was pregnant. We're kind of confused about how we submit that information. Uh, sorry, Baptist jokes. Um, we had Seth, who's in the Marine Corps, getting ready to be deployed. Uh, and we had Ryan, a college-age student. So it's delightful, and we're excited. And I just want to let you know, that what happens on Tuesday night in Hudson Hall doesn't happen without you. Because here's what happened too. Mindy, who's been coming for four weeks now, was invited by a Brentwood Baptist Church member who she happened to be their Uber driver. He took the time to ask her about her life, engage her in a gospel conversation, find out that she's unchurched and never thought she would fit in at a church with that steeple out front. But he said, why don't you show up on Tuesday night? And down front on the left, I'll be at a table waiting for you. She's been with us for four weeks ever since. So thank you. There's more. I don't know about you. I want more stories like that. I, I want more stories of us being the extended family of God, engaging the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. But here's what I know. We've already got a lot going on, don't we? Here's my promise to you this morning. I got nothing new for you. I'm not here to make you feel guilty about things that you're not doing. I'm not here to tell you to get your act together. I'm not trying to get you to crowd one more thing on your already overcrowded calendar. I just want to remind you, based off the authority of God's word, you have access to power through the Holy Spirit. That's it. I love what Samuel Johnson said. He, need, he said, we need to be reminded more than instructed. I'll tell you, you need to be reminded more of my kids. <laughs> I've instructed them 100 times, pick up after yourself. I'm constantly reminding them. Pick up 9,000 Icy Pop rappers, and I'm ready to, just to lose my mind. Like, who, no one picks up in this family, including me. <laughs> but I just noticed they're trash. When I'm picking up things after him, I feel the Holy Spirit patiently reminding me. Remember how many times I have to remind you throughout the day who you are, whose you are. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> but seriously, pick up after yourselves. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 1, we want to be the kind of church that preaches the Bible clearly and then gives people a chance to respond to it. So if you'll stand with me in the honor of reading God's word, Acts chapter 1, we'll start in verse 4. Acts 1, starting in verse 4. While he was together with them, that's Jesus, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of God at Israel this time? Still asking questions that apparently Jesus, they don't know the answer to. Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the time or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I'll say the word of the Lord if you'll say thanks be to God. 
The word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say the words that ravish your heart. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen? Amen. You guys can have a seat. Is it encouraging to anyone else but me, but the disciples still don't get it, that they're a bunch of disheveled doubters and deniers? Uh, well, just so you know, we're on this side of Resurrection Sunday. In this text, they're with the risen and resurrected Jesus. Scars in his hands on his side. They've touched. They're like, oh my gosh, it's true. Unbelievable. If you back up just a little bit in Acts chapter 1, they just got off a 40-day teaching retreat with Jesus about the kingdom of God. And they still got questions. Is it now? Is it now? When? Jesus, is it happening? And Jesus is so loving and patient. But the question I have for the text and for you this morning is, did you ever wonder what took a group of disciples from being a bunch of thick-headed, outcast peasants, constantly fearful and afraid, to brave, bold missionaries and emissaries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they're not there yet. They still got the risen and resurrected Jesus, and they're still fumbling. They're locking themselves behind doors. They're trying to figure it out. They're not really sure which direction to go. They're not sure about God's timing. I would submit to you that what made all the difference in the world was the ascension of Jesus Christ and the coming of his Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now here's what I know. There's about maybe 12 Holy Spirit people in here right now who you're about to come out of your chair and start running around and go, finally, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Just give me a high five as you go by, okay? <laughs> the rest of this message is not for you. It's for those of you right now who your arms are crossed and you're going, I'm telling Mike Glenn what you talked about. <laughs> Pump the brakes, bearded little preacher boy. You can keep all that Holy Spirit talk for your Tuesday night, Kairos kids, where you have that rock concert you call worship. I don't know what you're doing here. You're not going to be preaching again in a while. <laughs> Good, I can sleep in. <laughs> When's the last time the Holy Spirit moved in power in your life? Child of God, disciple of Jesus, when's the last time you can point to and go, the Holy Spirit came upon me with power to be his witness? Is it obvious, or is it obviously missing? Now, I know, I know. Uh, I, I grew up in a denomination that we believe the Holy Trinity was the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit, okay? Why? Because it's just goofy. Goofy people got the market cornered on the Holy Spirit most times, all right? We've seen people blame bad dance moves, bad decisions, bad dictation, um, and bad snake handling skills all on the Holy Spirit, okay? It got so bad in the 40s and 50s, he had to have a name change from his PR agent. He just said, hey, look, we got to go from Holy Ghost to Holy Spirit. You're scaring the kids. <laughs> My big fear is we've forgotten his name altogether. Would you and I know the difference of whether or not the Holy Spirit came in power this morning? Or would it just be business as usual? Check the box, go home, and get on with your life. I don't know about you, but I, I want more power in my life. And here's what I've learned. The power doesn't come the way I thought it would. I want power like power. I, I want to be able to call lightning bolts down from the sky. I want to be able to part the Harpeth Rivers for my friends as a party trick. And I want to be walking around and go, Holy Spirit, do you want me to witness to that person? And two doves descend on their shoulders without pooping. And then I would know, absolutely. <laughs> Just so we're clear, none of that has ever happened. Here's what's happened. I've been incredibly weak and insecure. And I've taken my fragile and fickle faith 
and said, Holy Spirit, if you prompt me, I'll be obedient, no matter how disastrous it's going to be. And normally it's not lightning bolts or high energy surges, although when those times come, I embrace them. I love the breakthroughs. I love the moments that we tell stories for generations and generations. But I also want the power of the Holy Spirit in my ordinary life. And nine times out of ten, it's just a little blip in my heart. I'm wondering if I'm going to listen long enough to his prompting. If I can put my phone down. If I can reschedule my overcrowded schedule to make space for him and whoever he's bringing in front of me. I don't know about you, but I want the power of the Holy Spirit, not only in the mysterious, but I want it in the mundane I want to make space and room. What would it look like this week if we just prayed for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us so that we could be his witnesses? I don't know about you, but I want my own life lived every day to be a sign and wonder that Jesus is risen and resurrected. And sometimes that comes because I take joy in the mundane tasks. That's a sign of the resurrected Jesus. A sign that I'm trying to be faithful to my wife day in and day out, even in the midst of when we got crazy kids and questionable finances. Is there a peace and a hope and a joy that I can carry myself with that points to the resurrected Jesus? Is there any power in your life of the Holy Spirit? What would it look like, church, if tomorrow morning you woke up and over your fruity pebbles... You ask the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you so you can engage your stepdaughter in a conversation. What would it look like for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you tomorrow at work when you're getting chewed out because you didn't meet sales figures and you just realize God is my provider and would you help me see across this desk someone who is insecure and wounded and how I can meet their needs? What would it look like If Monday at school, you're in the middle of boring algebra class and you're praying, come, Lord Jesus, come. (laughs) And he doesn't. He says, it's not for you to know the times. (laughs) See what I did there? That's in the text. (laughs) But because you asked for the power of the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of a boring, seemingly insignificant day, next period when you're in the cafeteria, and a cold square piece of pizza gets thrown down on your tray, and you look up and see the person next to you, the Holy Spirit goes, ding. And instead of ignoring them, you invite them to sit with them and discover that last night they were considering killing themselves if no one talked to them this day at school. What would the power of the Holy Spirit look like if we invited him into the mundane, ordinary aspects of our life? What does it look like to pray for the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit while you're doing dirty dishes and dirty laundry and making beds? And say, Father, I don't want to waste one second of this time. Is there anyone you need to bring my mind that I need to pray for? And if anyone comes around, help me be a living sign and wonder of the risen and resurrected Jesus. And it's not just in the mundane and ordinary stuff. I think sometimes we highlight, hey, what's worst case scenario possible? That's what God's calling you to do, okay? (laughs) Do you know that God created you to be more like you? One of the greatest ways that I rob the power of the Holy Spirit in my life is if I try to become more like Mike Glenn. I'm not him. God's not calling me to be him. He's, him is enough of him. (laughs) Bless you. Not calling me to be Scott Harris. Not calling me to be Michelle Dyer. All of them strategically, wonderfully, beautifully gift and positioned to operate out of their strengths and weaknesses and giftedness. That's why I love what Michelle Dyer does for us. She huddles us together and she offers for every member in this church, hey, figure out your personality, your skills, your giftedness, your calling, your story. Let's combine it all together so that you can engage the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody, including things you love doing. We like playing music, playing tennis, playing cards. We play Uno a lot at my house, all right? Ask the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you during those times. Maybe when you're more fully alive and fully joyful, then you'll be a magnet for the kingdom of God, and people will ask you, what's going on? Well, I don't know about you. I want some more joy in my life. 
I'm not trying to discount the tragedy and the difficulties that we face, but there's also hidden joys all around us. And maybe we need the power of the Holy Spirit to recognize them and respond to them. Maybe it's as simple as reading one of your kids a bedtime story and praying a short prayer over them and hoping over time that it'll take because your call is to disciple your family first. You listen to those kids sing, In My Life, Lord Be Glorified. I learned that song at their age. Do you know how many times I pray that and sing that? I wonder if the power of the Holy Spirit can't be present with us this week in our ordinary lives in extraordinary ways. Romans 12, 1 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. I love how one Bible translation puts that in everyday language. Here's what it says. Here's what I want you to do. Take your ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around and present it to God. The best thing you can do is embrace what God has done for you. That way, you'll readily recognize when the Spirit is moving and quickly respond. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on one thing that the Spirit's going to do in and through us this week. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you come upon us in power so that we can be your witnesses here and there, near and far, in Brentwood, Middle Tennessee, and the utter ends of the earth. But right now, would you instill in us a heightened awareness of your power and your presence? We're going to stand and sing in just a second, and I don't, I like what Mike says. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. But I ask you to do one thing. If you have the courage and the curiosity, pray, Holy Spirit, would you come upon me in power? Go ahead and do that right now. Now ask him what he wants you to do next. If that's a response to the gospel, great. We'd love to have a conversation with you. If that's to pray for someone else, please do so. If the Lord's bringing someone to your mind specifically right now that in the power of the Holy Spirit you want to pray for. But let's look and listen to all the places and people the Lord has lined up for us this week. Because whoever you are, wherever you are, may the power of the Holy Spirit come upon you to be his witnesses anywhere, anytime, any place. Unto you, Lord Jesus, our hearts are open. Lead us as we are led. Would you stand with me? Now in this moment, we're going to open our altars. If you'd like to continue that prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to come on you in power, to flood your heart. We have people at Next Steps that are ready to receive you, to pray with you. We'll give you time in this room. We have time. We want the Lord and the Spirit to have his way among us. So as we sing, you do business with the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. 
We're going to sing this second verse, but I'm going to ask if you would just hold out both of your hands in prayer as we sing. praying for you. We're going to pray in just a moment. Did you know that we have a team that's headed to Dominica? It's in the West Indies, Caribbean. The slide tells about them. They're going to do disaster relief. and They're leaving here shortly, and so we want to include this team in our prayer as we go. So as we do when we commission, even though they're not presently here, would you just reach out your hand and we'll pray together. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we pray for this team that's gonna follow you in this disaster relief and this mission work. To Dominica, this country Lord, that needs a touch from you. So protect them as they go. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, your love and your compassion anointing. Protect them and keep them safe. And Father, we pray for us, Lord, as we go as missionaries into our communities and our neighborhoods. Give us passion, anointing, and power. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you as you go in love and grace to serve the Lord.